Would you turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Genesis chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. As you're turning, let me remind you that we're going to take a break from John, and we're going to, since it's officially Christmas, and you can now officially put up your Christmas tree, we are going to have a Christmas series. Formerly, it's called the Incarnation and the Mission of God, or we can simply say, why, Jesus, why did Jesus come? Why did Jesus come? And if we're going to ask that question, we might as well start at the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 3. Now, as you have turned, let me ask you a question. How would you summarize the Bible in one sentence? If someone comes up to you and they say, why is Christ so important at Christmas? You got one sentence. What's it going to be? I heard someone answer this question once, and it was the best answer I've ever heard. Kill the snake, get the girl. Kill the snake, get the girl. Now, do you see the movement of that statement? The getting of the girl, the saving the, the church, per se, and her salvation is wrapped up in the killing or the judgment on the snake. It is salvation through judgment. What does that make you think of? How does that make you feel? We're going to pick that up this morning in our sermon in a sentence. Satan's curse is the Christian's blessing. Satan's curse is the Christian's blessing. Let's pray and then we'll jump right in. Heavenly Father, you revealed this to Adam as you revealed your will to Noah and Abraham and Moses and David. But to us it is revealed with much more clarity. That means much more is expected. Father, we cannot rise to those expectations on our own. So I pray that as we open your word, you would pour forth your spirit in abundance that this word may settle deep into our heart and work out through our life. Father, we ask these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. We're picking up in chapter 3, verse 14. Hear the word of the Lord. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field, on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And thus ends the reading of God's word this morning. Let's start with some historical context. We all know about the fall, don't we? Adam and Eve were told not to eat the fruit. Satan comes, tempts Eve, they eat the fruit. And all of mankind, descending from Adam, sinned in him and fell with him in this first transgression. We could say God commanded, Satan tempted, Adam sinned, and we have been willing slaves to sin and Satan ever since. We always talk about Adam and Eve. You know what we never talk about? What about Satan? What led Satan to this act of cosmic tyranny? I want to give you two reasons this morning. Two reasons that factor into Satan's curse. What leads Satan to do such evil? Well, first, there's the issue of pride. Ezekiel describes Satan as one who is wise and beautiful, did try to exalt himself above God. Though he was the created one, he wanted to be above God, through whom all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, all things. Satan's a prideful thing. That's one. But on the other hand, there's a problem of envy. 
Man was made in God's image. Man was made of clay. But what we read in Psalm 8 is that God made man a little lower than the angels, but crowned him with glory and honor. Man was made in God's image. Angels that cannot be set up. We have a special relationship with God that angels do not. Satan is envious. Pride may be the bottom of all evils, but when you mix pride with envy, you get malice. That malice would lead to the temptation. That malice would bring us into bondage, but that malice would also bring a malediction, a curse upon Satan for the salvation of mankind, for our blessing. Now, in our passage, God is doing two things. He's telling us about a who, and he's telling us a how. Both of these answer Satan's pride and envy. So let's start with the who. Who will inflict the curse? God has this thing, if I can use some theological language, called retributive justice. It is where the punishment fits the crime. In Obadiah 15, don't turn there, it's fine. Obadiah 15, he says, As you have done, so it will be done to you. What does that type of justice look like in Satan's curse? Well, first, God addresses the issue of pride. The one who defeats Satan must be stronger than Satan. Our ESV say bruise his head. But I think a better translation is crush his head. He must totally annihilate the serpent. This requires a great deal of power, doesn't it? You know, I got in a fight once, and it was with my best friend at the time. He was a good 60 to 70 pounds heavier than me. But he was cruising for a bruising. So I went up to him, and with all my might, I punched him in the face. I was going to crush him. He thought it was a fly. So I did the only reasonable thing. I ran away. I did not have enough power to crush him. Now we look at Satan, the ancient serpent. We look at Adam. Adam's in his prime. He's pristine. He's got it, the whole package. Adam falls without a shot fired. Man is no match. We look to the angels. Revelation says he took a third of the angels down with him. The book of Jude says Michael the archangel won't even pronounce a judgment on Satan. Angels are no match. We are no match. What are we to do? The only one powerful enough is God himself. How much more fitting is it to quash Satan's pride than by God himself doing it? That Satan sought to exalt himself over God, but it is God who comes down to kill the snake to get the girl. It is God who executes the curse. God, in the Son, overthrows the pride of Satan. But on the other hand, we have to deal with the problem of envy. And here we see that God uses the seed of the woman to eradicate his envy. Herman Witsius puts it best when he says, The proudest of spirits should be vanquished, not by a man, but by the woman, the very woman whom he had subdued, seeing that salvation is with the woman who was weaker by nature and first overcome, it is clearer than noonday that salvation is by grace alone. What Wizzius is getting at is the redemptive reversal, the irony, the humor in the grace of God. 
that God doesn't, Jesus doesn't come down on Christmas morning. He doesn't come down in fire and blitz. He comes from the seed of the woman. The very vessel of which Satan burned with envy is a vessel which will cast him into a lake of fire. The malice of Satan which sought blessing in her curse it is through her that we receive the blessing by Satan's curse. It is through weakness that God kills the envy of Satan. And through this we have a greater participation in God than Satan could have ever imagined. For the Son of God took on our flesh and united himself with us. In Satan's downfall, we have been lifted up. In his cursing, we have been blessed. The Son of God has taken on the seed of the woman. This is the who, the Jesus, the God-man incarnate. This is what we celebrate at Christmas with the incarnation. But the other question is the how. The how. He uses the language of crushing. We might expect a great display of power. We, may ex we have an image of crushing. But how does God display his power? How does he end the malice of Satan? How does he execute the curse? What we see in the Old Testament is the power of God is veiled in weakness. That the wisdom of God is veiled in foolishness. This is the means by which God overthrows the pride and envy of Satan. We've all read Judges. It's every young boy's favorite book. You read the book of Judges, who can forget Sisera? How Sisera conquers Israel with iron chariots and men of war. God defeats Syria. How does he do it? Does it? Is it on the field of battle? By no means. He goes and hides in a lone woman's tent and falls asleep after a Thanksgiving meal, and she gets a tent peg, and she does what? She crushes his head. Who could forget Abimelech? who by cunning and murder sought a place of power and prestige, and he hurls all of a village into a tower, and he begins to set the tower ablaze. How is he defeated? A woman drops a millstone. A woman, a, the weaker vessel, drops the symbol of her poverty from the tower, and what does it do? It crushes his head. What do we see in these two things? But God uses the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Who can forget the epitome of these things? Who can forget Christmas morning? The sun does not appear in resplendent glory. He does not set the world ablaze by his holiness. He does not reduce the dominion of darkness to stubble by his fury. What does he do? He is born in a manger to buy the seed of the woman in weakness, in poverty. The manger was but the storming of Normandy, but it was the beginning of a battle of epic proportions. In the manger, Satan is cursed. The honor of the woman is restored and blessing is brought to man. Who could forget the cross? Who could forget the temptation in the wilderness? When Satan tried to tempt Christ just as in the garden, how did Christ defeat Satan? Did he turn the stones to bread? Did he take the kingdoms? Did he display his power? No. He defeated him in hunger, in humility, and in weakness. He used the weak things to shame the strong. Who could forget the cross of Calvary? 
the place where power was cloaked in weakness and darkness and death. To deliver men from defilement, Christ would be defiled. To deliver us from sin and shame, he would become sin. He would endure shame. As Satan promised life leading to death, Nails held the dying arms of Christ wide open, promising life in his death. Do we not see this in the resurrection, in the ascension? Christ endured everything Satan could throw at him so that we could enjoy the blessings of God. He crushed Satan's pride with his humility, his envy with his generosity, the malice of Satan was defeated by the weakness of the God-man. But today Christ is risen, Satan is cursed, captivity is captive, and we are free. That Jesus Christ has ensured the blessing of man by implementing the curse on Satan. In Satan's curse, we are blessed. This is the who. This is the how. The God-man died, and on the cross, Satan was defeated. But the real question for us today is not the who and the how. The question is the why. How is his curse a blessing for us. Our text tells us three things. First, we see that God puts enmity between Satan's offspring and the offspring of promise. We see, he says, I will put enmity. When Adam and Eve took the fruit, when they swallowed it down, they swallowed down sin. Many of us here, we buy apps. Most of us have iPhones. Who, who reads the terms and, and conditions? Anybody? Nobody. You just hit accept, don't you? That's what Adam and Eve did. They didn't read the terms and conditions. They just hit accept. They entered into a relationship, a contractual agreement, a covenant with Satan. If I can use some good old southern terminology, Adam and Eve and Satan were drinking buddies. They got in trouble together. They caroused together. They were friends. To be friends with Satan is to be at ends with God. How would this relationship be severed? God tells us. He says, I will put enmity. God makes a covenant of grace with us. It's seen all throughout the Bible. I've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. God has caused me to be born again. God has given me a new heart. Are we seeing the trend here? You notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that Zach will produce enmity. It doesn't say John will give himself a new heart. It doesn't say Chip will transfer himself from one kingdom to the other. It doesn't say that Nana will birth herself. It is God doing the work. Do, we know what, do you know what we call that? Regeneration. It is a gift. It is a blessing. When we look to Cain and Abel, what separated the two? Was one a good seed and one a bad seed? No. Is it because one believed in God and the other didn't? No. God doesn't say, I will put belief. Even the devils believe. God says, I will put enmity. And we see it in their very sacrifice. Abel offers his by faith, laying himself upon the mercy of God. John says, Cain was of the evil one. It is God who puts the enmity. So I ask us here, who are we at peace with? Who are our friends? Who are we hanging out with? 
Is it God or Satan? Do we feel enmity towards Satan and his works? Or do we just be good old southern folks and say, let bygones be bygones? Our tank says, God puts enmity, not God puts neutrality. He causes us to be born again. The second blessing he gives us is that God fosters enmity. He fosters enmity. We call this sanctification. We call it sanctification. It's a blessing. It's a gift. It's a hatred of sin and a love for righteousness. We see this throughout the Bible. Everyone here has read Psalm 139. You know. If I go to the heights of heavens, you are there. If I go to the depths of Sheol, you are there. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it all together. These are beautiful thoughts about God. And then all of a sudden, he says, God, I wish you'd slay the wicked. And you think, David, where did that come from? Well, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? If you love God, you will love the things God loves. If you love God, you will hate the things God hates. It is a growing enmity. In John 17, Jesus prays for us. He prays that we will be in the world, but not of the world. He prays that we'll be on the offensive, that God will defend us from Satan, and what does Jesus pray? Sanctify them by thy truth. Sanctify them. Set them apart. Consecrate them. When Jesus wants us to be safe, he prays for a growing enmity. He prays for our holiness. He prays for our sanctification. This is why Jesus consecrated himself. He did not die in vain. He died that we would be set apart. So I ask, is there a growing enmity in your life? It's a little too soon for me to make this joke, but I'm doing it anyways, because it was Thanksgiving Thursday. A good friend of mine said that he's been on a diet. I said, how is that working out? He said, not too good. In the same way, we look at our hearts, how is that enmity growing in our lives? If we're constantly making excuses of why we can't do things, but yet we can always find time for worldly things, to catch the show, to watch the game, to, to be with these friends, to forsake our duties to God and his people, which one is growing? Enmity with God I mean, enmity with God, against God is friendship with Satan. Friendship with God is enmity towards Satan. It's one or the other. Are we growing in our love for God? Are we growing in our hatred for sin? What are two small steps we can make today to grow that love for righteousness? Church, I say all these things, and I say it in closing, that God puts the enmity, God fosters the enmity, God puts an end to the enmity. There will be a day when the church is made whole and we will crush Satan under our feet, when heaven and earth will be made new and that old serpent will be cast into a lake of fire and sulfur, when we can do what Robert Murray McShane says, when we can love God with an unsinning heart. What a day that will be. When Satan's curse reaches its climax, so will our blessing. Do you know what we call that? Glorification. It is a blessing. It is a gift. The manger was but the storming of Normandy was the beginning of Satan's curse and the beginning of our blessings. Christmas stands today as a monument of living hope 
for God to finish what he has promised in his word. Let us cling to that hope. Let us foster that enmity. Let us long for the day when it will be put to death, for God has promised it and he cannot lie. Satan is cursed. We enter into blessings. And would you pray for it with me? Heavenly Father, my mind goes to Galatians where he says, the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Father, all of us here are tired Tired of that battle. Tired of saying, why did I do that? Tired. Father, would you sustain us by a living hope that the great things that you have started, you will bring to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Would this hope bring life to our weary bones? Would it help us to strive to make these things our own as you have made us your own? We are thankful that you bear gently with our weakness. We pray that you would continue to strengthen us in the name of Jesus Christ.